On behalf of the Forge, I greet and salute every one of you and extend a very warm welcome to our panelist, the presenter, Advocate Tembala Nwai Tobi. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you, Advocate, for accepting our invitation and for always supporting our work. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. Our sincere greetings and appreciation go to our discussant for the evening, Professor Gordon Zide, Prof. Nkostapun. Thank you, Prof, for accepting our invitation. This evening's program will be facilitated by our comrade, Dr. Vashna Jagannath. Comrade Vashna will be driving this session. Thank you, comrade. We are looking forward to, to the whole session. Briefly about, uh, okay, before I, I go to the bios of our, of our comrades, I just want to also acknowledge the presence here with us of the SG of Monsa, the comrade Jim. <laughs> Briefly about our panelist, Advocate Tendela Mimantobi has written about the history of the black intellectual thought and, constitu and constitutional thought and on matters related to land, having ordered the best selling The Land is Ours, published in 2018, and Land Matters, published in 2021. He is interested in the life of Robert Mangai Sosobuwe, focusing on Sosobuwe's impact on apartheid legal system, on the apartheid legal system, and in turn, the impact of this system on the cause of Sosobuwe's own life. Can we give one to the time? And Uprof, Uprof Gordon Dodong Zizide is the chairperson of the Robert Mangai Sosobuwe Trust and Professor Emeritus in Anthropology at the University of South Africa, UNISA. He is the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Technology and is one of the co authors of the recently published South African Leaders' Challenges since 1994, a book that was launched recently at UNISA about two weeks ago. A round of applause for the host. Dr. Vashna Jagannath is a scholar activist and is the director of Pen Africa Today. She works in the office of the General Secretary of NUMSA. She is also the Deputy General Secretary of the Social Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party and Senior Researcher and Senior Research Associate at the Center for Social Change at the University of Johannesburg. <laughs> and briefly about the Forge, the Forge is a space for progressive culture and thinking together from Pan-African, socialist, feminist, and other progressive perspectives. We work closely with a, a wide range of left organizations, including community groups, social movements, and trade unions. And now we invite you all to enjoy this, evening, this evening's event, an exploration, an exploration of the interface of the life of Robert Mangaliso Sobowe and the apartheid legal system. and kick off with such an exciting program and the 45th anniversary of the death of Robert Subukwe. And I think in a time like this, you know, a country where we often are in darkness and feel lost and we have very few solutions. Um, it's wonderful to remember, not just for the sake of remembering or for nostalgia, but to engage in a very real way with experiences from the past, with lessons from the past and with alternatives that we don't have to accept the status quo. That even under the most extreme difficult circumstances, people arise to take up the challenge to liberate us. And I think that today will be such a moment for us to think through a life of someone who did that. And um, I'd like to ask 
I mean, I know it's not fashionable anymore to say the word comrade, apparently. That's why we have no electricity. Uh, comrade and Lenin and Marx are the reason why we have no electricity anymore. Uh, but I'll say, still say, comrade, say, Mega, could you please uh, go forward then? Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, tonight's lecture is entitled The Legality of Evil, Robert Sobukwe and the Apartheid Legal Order. I will speak about Robert Sobukwe and the apartheid legal order, not his politics. There is enough material on that topic. I do not claim to exhaust the subjects of Sobukwe's place within the apartheid legal order. I promise only to make some explanatory themes which are missing from today's recollection of Sobukwe's life. Even that promise, my promise, may turn out to be extravagant. Indeed, more illustrious writers have written about Sobukwe, his life, his beliefs, and his legacy. Mine is a limited part of his life, but it is important because it shaped who he became, and he in turn shaped the system of the apartheid legal order, exposing its excesses, immoralities, and depravities. We owe at least one provision in our Bill of Rights to Sobukwe namely section 36 of the Constitution, which requires that any law passed for the purpose of limiting the rights in the Bill of Rights should first and foremost be of general application. The immorality of the apartheid legal order was exposed by its desire to create a law for one man, Sobukwe. I am running ahead of myself, so let me start at the beginning. On 23 March 1960, Sobukwe and 22 other accused were charged before the magistrate's court in the district of Johannesburg with two charges. Acting in breach of section 2A of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1953, section 2 of that law made it a criminal offense to advise, encourage, incite, command, aid, or procure any other person or persons in general to commit any offense by way of protest against a law or in support of any campaign against any law. In effect, it was an offense to campaign for the change of the law. This amendment was the response by the apartheid government to the defiance campaign of 1952. At this campaign, there was agitation spearheaded by the ANC for the repeal of the past laws. A person found guilty under Section 2 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act could be imprisoned for a maximum period of five years. They could also be whipped for ten strokes. The charge sheet listed a second offence. Sobuka was also guilty, it was said, of violating Section 15 of Act No. 67 of 1952. The title of that law was called Natives, Abolition of Passes and Coordination of Documents. Its purpose was to provide for the issue of reference book, books to natives, and those were the passes. At the time he was charged, Sobukwe was without any formal employment. He had resigned his position as an assistant in Bantu languages at Viz University on the 20th of March 1960, finding it impossible to balance the competing demands on his time. He had decided to devote his time to the liberation of African people from apartheid. He was the president and founder of the Pan-Africanist Congress. In 1966, at the initiative of Peter Raboroko, the PAC added the term Azania to its repertoire of struggle. It would from that moment be called the PAC of Azania. The case against Sohuke did not proceed on the 23rd of March 1960 the prosecutor asked for a postponement. When the accused appeared on the 26th of March, Sobukwe applied for permission to attend the funeral of those killed at Sharpville on the 21st of March, 1960, which was in Ferienache. This was permitted. The trial eventually started on the 4th of April, 1960. On that day, the names of Robert Sobukwe, Potlako Nebalo, Selvin Gendani, Lennox Mlonzi, Rosette Nziba, Jacob Nyause, Zephania Mutoper, John Walaza, Daniel Kuno, Wellington Randaka, John Machete, Raphael Chabalana, John Nengwana, Josias Mazunya, Solomon Matopa, Zakaria Mtunzi, 
Abraham Bohale, Abe Hare, James Tamaye, Johannes Pasha, Lucas Mato, George Ndovu, Joshua Mahabe, George Suiza, and Lancelot Mahoti were called in as I choose to number one to number 23. I have decided to recall their names because in the official records, they are simply referred to as the others. Sabuqa's relationship with the law was that of an accused, no longer its chief defier as he had been in March 1960. The charges were not were for not carrying their own passes on the 21st of March, and as their ringleaders for inciting others to defy the pass laws. Almost immediately after the trial had commenced, Sobuka took charge. Standing up, he announced the intention of the accused. I quote, Your Worship, without impugning your personal integrity and honor, we refuse to plead, because our contention is that the law under which we are charged is a law made exclusively by the white men, specifically for the oppression and suppression of blacks, and the officers who administer that law are themselves white. And in this whole drama, only the accused are black, and we don't feel that justice can be done under those circumstances and we therefore refused to plead. The magistrate, Mr. J.K. Duplessis, cut him short, asking him, are you now speaking on behalf of all of the accused when you say you refuse to plead? Sobuka replied, I refuse to plead, Your Worship. The magistrate decided to put an end to the exchange. Well, in that case, the court must enter a plea of not guilty to both the main and alternative charges by all accused. Do you understand? Sobuka responded, I understand your worship. The first witness was Daniel Machuta, called by the state, described in the court records as a Bantu detective constable attached to the security branch state chief in Johannesburg. He had attended meetings of the PAC, taken notes of those meetings, and effectively spied on behalf of the government. And so was the second witness, Solomon Mdunga, another Bantu constable in the South African police attached to this security staff. His duties also included attending the meetings of the PAC, taking verbatim notes, and reporting to the white government. And so again was the third constable. It turned out that in all of the meetings of 1959 and 1960, the PAC had been infiltrated. The accused had not appointed a lawyer. Their approach, underpinned by the slogan, no bail, no defense, no fine, was to surrender themselves for arrest. They believed they could collapse the entire pass law system by filling the prisons with pass law accused. As the person leading the defense, Sobuka would ask the questions to each of the state witnesses before the other accused asked their own. Sobuka did, in a form of cross-examination, pose those questions, but with very limited success and effectiveness. For the evidence of the accused, Sobuka made a statement from the dock. Until this moment in history, no other political trialist had ever used a statement from the dock, which effectively amounts to turning the tables on the prosecutors, making the state to defend apartheid rather than the accused to explain their conduct. Sobuka reminded the magistrate, the court, Your Worship, you will remember that when the case began, we refused to plead because we felt no moral obligation whatsoever to obey the laws which are made by the whites and are administered for the whites, for an unjust law cannot be applied justly. We believe in one race, he said, only the human race to which we all belong. The history of the human race is a long history of struggle against all restrictions, physical, mental, and spiritual. And we would have betrayed the human race if we had not done our share. The magistrate was stunned, but he could not interrupt Sobuko. He was in his stride. Briefly put, Your Worship, he continued, our organization, the PAC, aims at the complete overthrow of the white of white domination. It was the prosecutor feeling a little bit of pressure from the sheer power of the words. He would object, Your Worship. The accused should not read from the notes that he had prepared. 
Yet Sohuko's response was reflective of his general calm demeanor throughout the trial. Even in the ultimate theater of the apartheid legal system, the court, he would retain his thoughtfulness and morality in his position. Your worship, he continued, I shall put the notes aside if that is the feeling of the crown. Then he proceeded to repeat myself, our organization aims at the overthrow of white domination and the establishment of a non-racial democracy in South Africa. It is the PAC's historical role, he continued, to contribute to the establishment of the United States of Africa. In the language of the movement, the United States of Africa will stretch from Cape to Cairo, from Morocco to Madagascar. The PAC, he pressed, represents thinking on a continental level. They stand for a government of Africans, by Africans, for the Africans, with everybody who owes his allegiance to the continent of Africa and is prepared to accept the democratic rule of an African majority being regarded as an African. So we were prepared to answer the questions from the prosecutor. The first question was, you told us in your evidence that on 8 November 1958, you seceded from the ANC. Why did you secede from this organization? So who was forthright, he would not be intimidated. The reason for the secession, he noted, was because of the adoption of the Freedom Charter, which stood for multiracialism, which the PAC condemns, because it implies transfer of the prejudices and the bigotry that applies in the present society to a new society. And in effect, that means racism multiplied. From the PAC's standpoint, the land belongs to all African people, not on the basis of slavery and mastership or dispossessor and the dispossessed. Is that true? The prosecutor asked rather incredulously. Yes, Sohoko replied. Who are the slaves that you are referring to? Sohoko's response was clear. The slaves are the Africans and the masters are the white people. The two cannot live hand in hand unless the majority rule the land. As this exchange took place, there was silence in the courtroom. The magistrate had reclined to his seat, no longer interjecting. When the judgment came on the 4th of May, it was perhaps unsurprising. The evidence of all of the witnesses of the state was accepted, and the evidence from the defense was rejected. In summarizing his conclusion, the magistrate st stated, the only question remaining to be dealt with is whether you incited or encouraged native people to contravene the provisions of the past laws. From his point of view, there was no doubt that this was indeed the case. Such slogan as no bail, no defense, no fine, inflamed and aroused the passions of the masses to follow their leaders in the PAC. Only four of the 23 original accused were acquitted. John Walaza, Joshua Machaba, Lancelot Mahosi, Mahoti, and John Machete. Although Matsunya had been expelled from the PAC on the 1st of March 1960, he was ultimately found guilty of the charges. Sobukwe, long perceived by the state as the prime mover behind the Shabbat protest, was sentenced to three years imprisonment. The remaining 18 accused were sentenced to between 18 months and two years in prison. The slogan of the PAC, no bail, no defense, no fine, also meant that there would be no appeal. But in fact, appeals were submitted. While no attorneys were retained for the trial, one was hired for the appeal, Mr. S.S.A. Sikakani. Advocate Jack Unterhalter represented Sohukwe and the others in the appeal. The appeal was held in the then Transvaal Provincial Division of the Supreme Court and dismissed summarily on the 8th of November 1960. While the appeal was pending, Sobuko had in fact began the life of a prisoner shortly after the sentencing. In those days, unlike now perhaps, it was not unusual for a convicted, a convicted prisoner to commence their sentence while the appeal process was taking place. With the handing down of the sentence on 4 May 1960, Sobukwe's relationship with the apartheid legal system was again transformed from accused to convict and prisoner. He was taken to the Johannesburg prison, notorious for the incarceration of political detainees, 
known as number four, the fort. Today we know this to be the place which houses our constitutional here. How would the system treat him now that he was no longer agitator, he was no longer an accused, but he was a prisoner? At the fort, the harshness, the brutality, the hostility began all over again. Although his jailers had no control over his ideas, they had total control over his body. He would exchange his clothes for prison uniform, which were a pair of short pants, a khaki shirt, and a jersey. No shoes. Later on, sandals without socks were given to him. They also shaved his head. And no, they wouldn't touch him. In fact, they asked another prisoner to do so. And that prisoner used a razor blade with a little water and soap, and often leaving the scraped head with cuts and bleeding. They must have enjoyed the cruel spectacle. Finally, they were able to insult him, to spit on him, and to show him that they are his boss. Although the fort incarcerated political prisoners, they were common criminals too. In their company, Sobu could find himself in an unfamiliar place, in a bit of a wilderness. He would be at the receiving end of their maltreatment, no doubt eager to please the white prison authorities. He noted that one of his responsibilities was administering political education to the criminal prisoners that he found at the fort. In fact, one prisoner would later recall the power of the prof's teachings in being proud of who you are and how this helped him after his release from prison to reform himself from the life of criminality and banditry into a responsible father for his family and his children. So who has served the balance of his sentence at the Pretoria Central Prison? Their paths crossed once again with Nelson Mandela, who was serving a five-year sentence. They apparently shared a cell. Sobuka was due to be released from Pretoria Central on 3 May 1963, having completed the three-year sentence. But this did not happen. Instead, on the 1st of May 1963, an extraordinary thing happened. The Minister of Justice, Hubert Pelsa, the Prime Minister, Hendrik Verwood, and Charles Swart, the state president, all played a role in piloting a new law, which was published in the Extraordinary Government Gazette of the 2nd of May 1963, to amend the Suppression of Communism Act. The core of that law was contained in Section 4, which was a long section, but its effect was clear. The Minister of Justice at the time B.J. Forster had the power to extend the sentence of any prisoner falling into identified categories, including political prisoners, notwithstanding the sentence imposed by a court. Although the law purported to be general in its scope of application, it was known that, in fact, its object was the continued incarceration of Sobuka. Hence, Section 4 was referred to as the Sobuka Clause. The law, in fact, confirmed Sobukwa's standing as a political prisoner. And by this I mean a prisoner who was in prison, not because the court had pronounced him guilty of a crime, but because the political establishment had considered him a political risk. Sobukwa was in prison on the instruction of a politician, the Minister of Justice, not on the instruction of a judge. There was widespread condemnation of the law. The Spectator of London labeled the law simply as barbarism, stating that it is difficult to imagine a more refined form of torture than to wait until a man is within days of completing a long prison sentence and then to announce that he is not going to be released after all, but will be kept in jail indefinitely. On the 1st of May 1963, indeed, B.J. Forster announced that the cabinet had decided that Robert Mamadis Osobu, whose prison sentence expires on 3 May 1963, will be detained under the Suppression of Communism Act of 1950, as amended by the General Law Amendment Bill, which has just been passed in Parliament. Something extraordinary had happened. The law had been passed within 10 days after it was initially piloted. Sobuka, however, was no longer in Pretoria, 
He had been secretly taken to Robben Island. A. B. Ngo, an executive member of the PAC, told Sobukwe's biographer, Benjamin Pogrum, that Sobukwe's intention was to organize for the PAC as soon as he was let out of prison. But he had the premonition that something was afoot and that he would not be allowed out of prison. This indeed came to pass as on the 23rd of April 1963, he was secretly spirited out of Pretoria to Robben Island. No announcements were made until Foster's public statement, which confirmed the continued imprisonment of Sobukwe. Despite being a prisoner, prison officials still felt the need to expand their control over Sobukwe's activities. In December 1963, a visit from Ernest Sobukwe, his elder brother, who was also a reverend, was permitted by the prison authorities. Yet in January 1964, two visits from Benjamin Pogrund were denied. And so was the request of an interview by Mr. M. T. Murani of the World Newspaper. As a prisoner, the state's attitude towards Sobukwe remained ambivalent. For example, in one month, Benjamin Pogrund was granted two visitation privileges on the 3rd and 21st of April 1964. In that visit, Pogrund learned that the prison authorities had censored subscriptions which were arranged for Sobukwe in respect of the London newspaper known as the Observer. But there was denial from the prison authorities. While they were willing to grant Mr. Pogrom visitation rights, the prison authorities at first inexplicably refused the same privileges to his wife, to, so to Sobukwe's wife, Veronica, or as Sobukwe himself called it, Zodo. A letter of 3 June 1964 from Veronica makes an application to visit their husband but it was turned down with no reason other than the short reply, the minister is not prepared to grant your request. That also meant that Sobukwe's children could not visit him in prison. The attitude is also evident in the approach of the authorities to other visits. Father Flexmo, a priest, had applied to visit Sobukwe on the 14th of June 1964 for religious reasons. First, it was indicated that there would be no objection but then, when the police objected, the magistrate also declined the visit. And yet, Reverend Story was allowed a visit. Despite Mrs. Sobukwe having been told that her visit would be denied, a month later, in July 1964, it would be granted, but only on one condition, <coughs> that she would visit her husband thrice weekly during a period of 28 days, as from the 23rd of July, 1964. No explanation was forthcoming why the visit had first been declined, and why it was granted, and why the conditions were imposed. Sobukwe had no control over his physical health either. This was under the control of the magistrates. When the district surgeon, Dr. Van Bergen, arranged a visit by a dentist, the magistrate was furious writing to the Secretary of Justice, reprimanding him for allowing a dentist to visit a prisoner. The Department of Justice would later relent, ultimately agreeing that visits, including by doctors, could only be authorized at the instance of magistrates. What this meant was that it was not the opinion of doctors about Sobukwe's life, that Sobukwe's health that mattered, but the police and the magistrates. The security police could overrule the doctors as to the desirability of a specialist physician or a dentist visiting Sobukwe. <coughs> By December 1964, Veronica had learned the ways of the Robben Island system. Her visits to her husband during that period experienced less hassles than the July visits. But she was still warned that her visits should be limited to three times a week for one month a year. Earlier correspondence shows that the police considered instructing her that she could also not sleep at Robben Island because there were no such facilities. Apparently there were no beds there. <laughs> but it appears that this was later revoked. Sobukwe, it must be recalled, was not an ordinary prisoner. He had a separate prison facility where he was kept alone. His company were the prison guard and the prison dogs that often barked menacingly and incessantly. 
So Bubba had also learned about another law, the law of the prison. There was the written law of the country, and even for an apartheid legal system, whose laws by definition were obnoxious, certain fundamental protections were afforded to prisoners. But there were also other laws, and these were the laws that were practiced inside the prison. And these laws could be taken arbitrarily, others could be broken arbitrarily at the discretion of the officials and their magistrates. An isolated prisoner, far, far from the media, legal institutions, parliamentary inquiries, is no match for a prison system. The system was also fighting a total war. By denying him reading material, the prison guards could diminish his intellectual faculties. By arbitrarily curtailing visitation rights by his wife, they could damage his emotional well-being. In controlling access to physicians and dentists, the authorities could debilitate his physical well-being. And by restricting the visits of the priests, the prison authorities could destroy his spirit. These were the laws of the prison, often operating in unofficial, yet insidious and distress, distressing and damaging ways. So Mukwe's story was by now no longer only a matter of law. It had also become a matter of politics. Politicians in opposition to the government began calling for his release. Mrs. Helen Sussman, Sussman was elected to the House of Assembly under the ticket of the United Party, representing the constituency of Houghton in Johannesburg. Because the United Party, of the United Party's support for the Separate Amenities Act of 1953, designed to enforce petty apartheid, Mrs. Sussman resigned from the United Party. She then established the Progressive Party, which espoused liberal ideals. By 1964, Mrs. Sussman was still a member of parliament. She had taken keen interest in the imprisonment of Sobukwe and began a campaign in parliament to call for his release. But unlike Sobukwe's earlier encounters with the law, inside a court and in prison, Sussman's campaigns sought to engage a different legal institution within the apartheid architecture, namely parliament. If the executive unfairly suppressed Sobukwe and the judiciary had shown little interest in intervention, could parliament perhaps open a new avenue to champion the rights and the possible release of Sobukwe? On the 7th of, July, of February 1964, Mrs. Sussman began her campaign. The question which she posed in parliament pertained to the difficult subject for Sobukwe, one that had caused him much anxiety and reflection. <coughs> Mrs. Sussman asked the Minister of Justice whether the person detained on Robben Island in terms of Section 4 of the General Law Amendment Act 1963 had applied for an exit permit for himself and his family and his soul, whether the application had been granted. You see, an exit permit was a one-way ticket out of South Africa. If granted, it could mean that Sobuka would lose his rights to the citizen of South Africa. But as it turned out, in that parliamentary exchange of the 7th of February, Sobuka had in fact applied for an exit permit on the 3rd of January 1964. Whether or not he intended to lose his South African citizenship could be a matter of conjecture. What is clear is that the act of incarceration in the hands of the politicians had rendered his stay intolerant and he was willing to accept an exit permit out of South Africa. In 1965, a fresh campaign began, still driven by Sussman. The focus was the direct confrontation inside of the hallowed chambers of parliament with the Minister of Justice. The campaign had international dimensions too. On the 19th of April 1965, Mr. Abingo, a member of the executive of the PAC in Elza, delivered a standing address at the United Nations General Assembly to the Special Committee on the Policies of Apartheid. There, he referred to Sobukwe as the national leader of our people confined to Robben Island under Clause 4 of the General Law Amendment Act. Novo brought the, hy the hypocrisy of the apartheid legal system to the fore. It was the police he charged who had opened fire at unarmed people in Sharpville and London, where they brutally massacred African people. Yet, the police were not on trial. It was Sobukwe 
the leader of the dead, that was the only man who had been held and imprisoned without trial under the Sobuka clause. And that imprisonment, the Minister of Justice had pronounced, would last until this side of eternity. Mr. Chairman said, Mr. Noble concluded, my petition is that this man must be set free. Although the speech received universal acclaim, at home, the National Party remained unmoved. On the 3rd of June, 1965, Mrs. Suzman had astonished the National Party in government when she directly challenged them on the imprisonment of Sobuka. Until then, the generally held view within the white conservative population was that the government was taking necessary steps to curb the possible spread of communism and the spread of revolution which threatened white interests. So uh, Suzman began by attacking the apartheid law which entitled the police to hold people for extended periods of time in detention without trial. One person, for instance, had been held for 19 months without trial, another for 18, and Stanley Mabizela of East London for 17 months. Nine men had been held for 10 months without a trial. And yet the government's position was always that if you are innocent, you have nothing to fear. But for Suzman, this was unacceptable, as no one should be kept in prison, just in case they may be guilty. And even when the courts had acquitted them, the police had the strategy of simply rearresting anyone that they deemed to be a threat to their interests. Then Suzman shifted attention to her campaign for the release of Sobuka. By then, Sobuka was in his third year of imprisonment. He had now doubled the original penalty of three years. Suzman explained that her disagreements with Sobuka's political views did not mean that Sobuka could be kept in prison indefinitely. Let me quote from her. It is true that he was the head of the PAC, speaking about Sobu, with whose political views, aims, and objects I disagree entirely. But when the major trouble arose, the Boko and other troubles which were identified with the PAC, Sobu was already in jail. And I presume that if a man is on Robben Island, he cannot cook up Boko, and therefore he can in no way be held responsible for the Boko attacks. Suzman's simple plea, simple plea, as she put it, was that no man should be held after he has served his sentence for the crime of which he was duly convicted unless he commits another crime again. He demanded the minister to explain why Sobuka was still in detention. There was no reply from the government's benches. Only Suzman was accused as being a mouthpiece of communists and agitators. The government also mumbled something about recidivism, that the law was necessary to stop people from reoffending. And, as they stated, in their belief, the minister would not typically abuse his powers. So if a person had been denied release from incarceration under the law, it was most likely because they did not deserve to be released. The government would simply not budge on Sobukwa's release. Suzman's questions and Noble's speech in the United Nations served only to increase the cause for Sobukwa's release domestically and internationally. One of the impacts of those speeches was a panic within the National Party establishment, which opened the possibility that some selected journalists could visit Sobukwa. One of those was a journalist from Dibega, which was pleased to publish a report accompanied by a picture of a healthy looking Sobuko in his prison cell standing next to a policeman on the 20th of August 1965. If the intention of Dibega's publication on the 20th of August 1965 had been to portray an image of a fit and healthy Sobuko, it was being undermined by medical science. Dr. Barry Kapler examined Sobukwe on the 20th of October 1965 on the recommendation of the district surgeon and with the consent of the police. He recommended an operation for possible uh, uh, prostate. This could not be done on the island because a fully equipped theater was necessary. Dr. Kaplan recommended that Sobukwe should be transferred to the new Somerset Hospital. But he made it clear that this was urgent. Sobuka also needed a new pair of glasses, 
since he had not changed his glasses since 1956. The operation was not done urgently, even though the visit was in October. Sobuka was only seen at Karl Bremer Hospital in January 1966. The, the report of the Star newspaper of the 9th of February 1966. Okay, shall we wait for the kids to... <laughs> All right, let's do that. That's a, generally regarded to be a good sign. The Star newspaper of the 9th of February 1966 would report Sobukwe, who is confined on Robben Island, left the Karl Bremer Hospital yesterday after he had been operated on for a prostate gland. Members of the South African police brought him to hospital secretly about 14 days ago and he was registered as a patient under another name. His identity was so well guarded that not even the Watts sisters knew that one of South Africa's best known political prisoners was being treated there. Sobuka himself did not disclose his identity to the staff. Even in sickness, his name was not meant to be spoken about. The operation did not improve his state of health. Veronica wrote a letter to the authorities on the 5th of March 1966 in which she protested that Sobuka's health had deteriorated. When I saw my husband, she noted in the letter, he was complaining about other aspects of his health. He had developed rheumatism. His eyes and teeth were, give, were giving his trouble. His finger joints were swollen and disfigured. These complaints, which were also echoed by Pogrud, were simply brushed aside by the authorities, merely recorded, recording that in their view, there was no justification to the complaints. The Minister of Justice sought again for the fourth time to extend the law on the 2nd of February, 1966. And despite objections, the law was extended. When the question arose as to why the law was being extended for the first, fourth time. The minister responded, we do not regard Sobukwe as a prisoner, we regard him as a detainee. Concessions, he claimed, had been made in respect of the visits from his wife and his children. This was the fourth extension of the law. And yet, there, was, there were more extensions. Minister Pelser, must have given the game away on the 12th of June, 1968, when he said, if I have to consider the extension, what is in the best interest of the country is what I'm looking for. That one man be detained under favorable circumstances or that the safety of the country be threatened by his being released, that is all that is involved. We can talk here about this matter for days and we shall not make any progress at all. It was in the 1969, debates after Sobuko had now spent nine years in prison that the government finally relented. But that was not because, that was not before the now notorious remark of Pelsa. When he was asked why Sobuko should not simply be placed on house arrest like the government had done in relation to Chief Albert Lutuli, president of the ANC, the government's reply was the following. Compared to Sobuko, Lutuli is a lightweight. <laughs> On the 12th of May, 1969, the Minister of Justice finally withdrew the notices under which Sobukwe had been detained at Robben Island. That set the scene for his eventual release. But even as he left Robben Island, the apartheid legal order refused to let him become a free man. Instead, a fresh notice was issued, this time under Section 9 of the Suppression of Communism Act. He would not be allowed to return to Johannesburg, where he resided at the time of his arrest. He would serve a banishment order in the black township of Khadeshiwe in Kimberley. There would be strict conditions. He would not attend gatherings, whether social, political, or even attend schools at the school assembly. No student could be addressed by him. He could not absent himself from his home at number 6 Naledi Street, Khadeshiwe at any time except during the period commencing at 6 in the morning and ending at 6 in the afternoon. 
He could not be in a Bantu hostel, Bantu compound, a factory, a newspaper office, or any place of learning. A new chapter was, however, about to begin, despite these restrictions. At Roman Island, Sobuka had completed a degree in economics, in addition to his previous qualifications of BA honors in languages. But now, his banning orders prevented him from teaching. Yet the ban contained an exception in respect of court proceedings, where he could appear as a witness or for purposes of doing a case on behalf of an accused person. It was this gap that Sobuka would exploit in the final chapter of his life. This was now the beginning of Sobuka's journey to qualify as an attorney. Sobuka approached an attorney who was practicing in Kimberley, and his name was H.Z.M. Nzimande, who was at Royal Street at the Hanashiwe village. Mr. Nzimande was happy to accept Sobuka as an articulate clerk, provided that the security branch would grant the permission. That was the easy part. Mr. Nzimande would not pay Sobuka, despite being his clerk. As a university graduate, however, Sobuka would be required to serve articles for three rather than five years. An offer for lectureship and PhD studies at the University of Wisconsin did not materialize because although an exit permit was granted, the Minister of Justice refused to relax Sobuka's restrictions to enable him to leave the magisterial district of Kimberley. A court application brought in this connection failed. That, in a sense, enabled Sobuka to commence his articles of clerkship. His banning orders, however, remained. He could not travel out of Khaneshiwa without permission, nor could he receive visitors at home. A letter of 24 September 1973 proves how absurd the situation had become. He wrote to the magistrate of Kimberley, requesting the permission to receive visitors at home, other than the visitors specified in the notice. This is what he said. My application is based on the fact that as an article clerk, quite a number of people who find our offices closed over the weekend and or find Mr. Zimande out attempted to take their problems to me at home. But because of my banning order, I cannot receive them in my house. So because banning order issued upon his release from incarceration in 1969 and valid for five years, lapsed in 1974. But instead of scrapping it altogether, now that Sobuke was on a new journey to become a lawyer, it was extended by another five years. By February 1975, Sobuke had completed his articles. An application had to be made for the admission, for his admission as an attorney. His Johannesburg correspondent attorney was Desri Mamsi Fima, the very first African female attorney in South Africa, admitted in 1969 who was in a partnership with Godfrey Peter, who most of you would remember from the African National Congress Youth League. But as he was still a banned person, a request to vary the terms of his banishment to enable him to practice as an attorney was made. This time, the minister was Jimmy Kruger. He granted the permission, surprisingly, on the 20th of March, 1975. And on the 13th of June, 1975, Sobukwe was admitted as an attorney. The judge who admitted Sobukwe as an attorney was Leona van der Heever, herself the very first female judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. Sobukwe did not stay long with Mr. Zimande after his qualification as an attorney. Indeed, by February 1976, he had opened his law firm R.M. Sobukwe, attorney, practicing at number 24 Tyson Road, Hanashiwa, Kimberley. Sobukwe had now completed the full cycle. The law was once used against him. Now he could also use the law. But it was still a bad law, drawn with racial prejudice and designed for discrimination. He would have to apply it, nevertheless. But mostly, he would have to undertake the moral, spiritual, intellectual, emotional journey to find spaces within a bad law so that he could do justice to his clients. He did not live long after that moment. In 1977, because of his deteriorating health, 
he could no longer fulfill his dream of using the law to help his people. Today, in 1978, sadly, he passed on. The official record shows that he died from prostate cancer. He was 53 years of age when he died. Zodo, his widow, lived to see the dawn of freedom. She died on the 15th of August, 2018, from ill health. Some of Sobukwe's comrades from the trial went on to play prominent roles within the PEC, inside and outside of South Africa, and in Elsa. Kotla Konebalo, for instance, died in London in 1986. Zefania Mutopeng, fondly remembered as the Lion of Azalia, was in and out of prison. He would later become the president of the PAC, but also died before his beloved Azalia could be liberated. It is impossible, probably imponderable, to speculate tonight about what the prof would have made of today's crisis-ridden South Africa. We can say, however, that he would have put humanity first. So we remember him. He's a yeah. yes. Thank you so much for that. It was really rich and a uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we'll have the response now by Comrade Bosnick. 